Are you ready to get compost on your carpet, foliar spray on your Friday best, and pollen on your pantsuit? Great, because it's time for On The Ledge Podcast with me, your host, Jane Barone. And in this week's show, I'm talking to the author of a new book called The Indoor Garden. That's Jade Murray. Plus, we hear from listener Dorian and I answer a question about wick watering. Thank you to Jame Plants this week who left me a lovely review for the show, giving me five stars. Thank you so much, Jame Plants. And here's a little anecdote. When I first moved to the States, my roommate thought my name was Jame rather than Jane for a good few <laughs> a good few weeks before I realised that she didn't have my name right. Uh, so that was a fun conversation. <laughs> uh, shy and retiring English person as I was, uh, it took me a while to pluck up the courage to tell her that she'd got it wrong. Oh gosh, those were the days. Thank you also to Sarah and Louisa who became legends this week, joining my Patreon clan. When I was doing the cards for my Patreon subscribers at the legend and superfan level, I realised that I have an incredible spread of patrons from around the globe, everywhere from Long Beach, California, to the Falkland Islands, Hong Kong skyscrapers, to tiny English villages, to the outback of Australia. What a fascinating bunch you are. So if you want to join that Patreon gang, please do check out the show notes at janeperone.com. You can also just give a one-off donation via the platform code-fi.com or coffee.com. I never quite know how to pronounce it after all these years. So if you don't want to give a regular amount, but you just fancy chucking the cost of a cup of coffee at me, then please do that too. It all helps to support the show which is after all free and there are almost 200 episodes freely available for you to listen to. If you want to unlock the first 50 episodes of the show, which does include some really epic episodes like the one about the Chinese money plant and how to grow an avocado from seed, you can become a patron and that unlocks that content too. Now, if there's one thing that today's guest Jade, Murray and I have in common is the fact that we both have children and indoor gardens. And that's something we chat about in her interview today. Jade's new book, The Indoor Garden, Get Started No Matter How Small Your Space, is out now. Uh, I'll put a link in the show notes to this title. In the US, it's being published under the name Beginner's Houseplant Garden. So I'll put links for both the UK and and the US edition into the show notes. I had a feeling that Jade's houseplant obsession wasn't a new thing in her life. So I wanted to find out first where this all began. So I would start with me being a child. So I must have been about six or seven. And I used to spend a lot of time at my nan's house and she had a balcony garden Um, Where I lived at home with my mum, we didn't have a garden. No one in my family actually had gardens, but my nan had a balcony garden. So I used to spend a lot of time as a child um, watering her plants, helping her sow seeds, repotting and all that sort of stuff. So that was really where my passion and love for plants started as a child. That's really lovely to hear. And I think uh, lots of people will relate to that being the start of their love of plants with a family member. Uh, It's a really special thing to enjoy. And here we are now, you've published a book. How did you end up writing a book about houseplants? It's such a random story. So what happened was last year, I think it was April, I was actually washing up my dishes and I was listening to a show over here in in the UK called BBC The One Show. And one of the presenters has said, um, we're going to be seeing someone who's um, who's got 300 houseplants and we're going to be having a look. So I stopped what I was doing in the kitchen, ran to the living room. I thought, oh, my gosh, I need to see this woman's 300 houseplants because I've got about 70. I want to see what hers looks like. So I was watching the whole segment, beautiful house she had, loads of houseplants. And after that segment, there was a competition, the RHS My Chelsea Garden Competition. And that entailed people up and down the UK can submit a photo of either their front garden, back garden, roof terrace or an alternative garden 
category. So obviously I entered a photo of my indoor garden, which fitted the category for alternative garden. And I actually went on to win the competition and got an RHS Gold Award for my indoor garden. And on the back of that show, my publishers had reached out and said to me, we loved how you were on BBC The One Show. We can't believe how many houseplants you've got and the knowledge you've got, you know, we'd love to offer you a book deal. So that was how that came about, the book. And what do you think it was about your particular space that inspired the judges to give you the prize? Do you know what? That is actually such a hard question to answer because because it's my home and they're my plants and I just style them how I want. I suppose it's like I took it for granted, you know. I suppose it's when I'd have visitors and they would come and they'd be like, oh my God, Jay, this is beautiful. But it's just because it's mine and it's what I've done. Yeah, so I don't know how to answer that. I don't know why I won it, but I suppose, yeah, they really appreciated how I've styled my plants, how I've taken care of them. And they're very carefully placed in the perfect location in my, in my the home. So a lot of the shaded uh, plants that don't like direct light, they're in the perfect location. Plants that love brighter light, I have um, spotlights on them. So they're obviously elements that the, the one show picked up on and realised the amount of thought and detail I've put into my house plants and where I've placed them and how I've styled them. Yeah, I mean, looking at the pictures, I can tell that you've got an amazing collection. How many house plants have you got now? Has it gone up? No, it hasn't gone up. So I'm, I'm about seventy. Could you fit more <laughs> in, or are you quite? I know you've got children like me, so you know you have to be a bit respectful of the fact that they might not want to have be living in an actual jungle. I do have space for more. I just have to be very disciplined not to get any more. And um, because it, it requires a lot of time and care and attention. And at the moment, my time is very limited after the book's been released. So um, I've been very disciplined and not buying anymore. But no, my kids actually love our indoor garden, especially because they have autism or three of my children. So they've actually found having the indoor plants very therapeutic for them. And I've definitely noticed that in them as well. The benefits of having the indoor garden. That's really interesting. So how do they interact with the plants? Do they get involved with the care or do they just enjoy looking at them or how do that how does that work? So for my daughter who's 10, she's very hands-on. Um, she reminds me of me at her age actually when it comes to plants. So she likes to help me propagate, repotting, um, wiping down the leaves, keeping them dust free. Um, she's into it, misting them, all of that sort of stuff. The boys, my 17-year-old son and my 12-year-old son, they more just appreciate the visuals, so the sensory appeal that it has, especially my hanging plants. They uh, love the shadows on the walls that they create. Um, very sensory for them. So, um, yeah, they all appreciate our indoor garden in their own way. And I've definitely noticed how calm and tranquil it makes the house feel, which definitely has had a positive effect on them with their autism. That's so interesting. And as you say, there are so many shapes and silhouettes that plants make that can be appreciated on so many different levels. Do you think that that's something that people sometimes miss out on, the potential of houseplants to provide that kind of sensory experience that's so valuable for children? Yes, I do, actually. I think that a lot of indoor plants, they have the common visual of them. So they're quite waxy leaves you know, plain green. But there's a lot of plants out there, i.e. the Cissus discolor, also known as the Rex Bogonia vine, which has very textured leaves, so almost like a velvety appearance to it. And if you put it at a certain angle in the light, they almost shimmer the leaves. So there's so much other sensory elements, feel, touch, vision, that you can actually get from your plants in general. And like I said, my children really appreciate that. Well, that's lovely to hear. I, I do sympathise, though, with the struggle about time. It's tough. I mean, through, I have two children, you have three. And I think people assume that when they get sort of towards the teenage years that it gets less time involved. But actually, I don't think that's really true <laughs> no, for I me anyway. <laughs> I imagine that like me, clearing a little bit of time for some plant maintenance is actually a bit of a treat for you. Yeah. Do you know what? I actually find it really therapeutic. I mean, um, there's always one day of my week where I'm like, that's plant day. So even if my friends or my family's like, let's go out today. And I'm like, nope, sorry, that's plant day. And for me, literally, plant day means plant day. It's not a few hours. 
it's the whole day. <laughs> so, um, and in that time, for me, I feel like I'm meditating because my mind switches off and I'm literally just paying attention and nurturing each individual plant. And like I said, I've got about 70. So um, each and every one has their own unique care needs. And yeah, it's just like therapy. I really enjoy it. And do you think your children will go on to have their own? Have they got kind of their own plants or are they are they sort of do you think they might sort of take on the mantle that you've started and grow their own house plants? Or do you think it's something that's just while they're while they're at home with you, they're enjoying? I think for my daughter, the one who's more hands on with the plants, she's definitely getting into plants. So when we do go um, out to garden centers, she's like, oh, mommy, can I have that plant? Um, so she likes to have she's got a few plants in her room and she's in charge of maintaining them and caring for them because I've taught her what she needs to do so now she maintains her own plants in her bedroom which is lovely yeah that is really special my son's started to get into plants I think I probably don't realize the extent to which my children have kind of absorbed a lot of plant knowledge but my son in particular who's 12 is really getting into plants now and he's just he tends them so carefully it's really nice to see so yeah it's it's That's it is lovely. really special and you can share that knowledge and do you find that uh when other people come to your home that you kind of end up being evangelistic about the benefits of house plants for you and your kids and sort of encouraging other people obviously you've written a book so i guess the answer is yes but when you have friends come around are they like oh i want to do this in my house yes i do have when people come around they're like Oh, they, you know, they'll ask me, oh, what's that plant? And I'll explain to them and about, oh, that's an air purifying plant. If you have one, you should put that one in your bedroom and because it'll help you purify the air. So people, when they come to my house, they are very interested. I almost sometimes feel like they're a bit taken back or a bit um, mesmerised by the whole thing because um, it is unusual to have so many plants in a living room stroke dining room and for you to have that rainforest feel in your indoor space. But um, yeah, people definitely are interested when they come around and we always end up having long, extensive plant conversations, which is lovely, my favourite subject. <laughs> and do people, are people like, I mean, as, whenever I have a sort of a planty person come around, they always end up leaving with about five cuttings and some, you know, bits and pieces to take away with them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that happens yeah, a lot exactly. here. <laughs> um, people always leave them with a few cuttings from my plants. And it's lovely that... Um, People will come to mine and be like, oh, it's spring, so I've, I've given you a few cuttings. And where I live as well, it's a really lovely close-knit community. And because I'm known as the plant lady, because um, the front of my house is full of window boxes and plants, and so is my back garden, sometimes I'll come home and there's a few plants left on my doorstep with a note saying it's from Susie <laughs> at number 192. And I'm like, oh, that's so lovely. Thank you. And lots of seeds get popped through my letterbox. So it's really, really nice. Lovely. We're coming to the time of year here in the UK where things get a little bit more challenging on the houseplant front. I'm hoping you can offer some listeners some tips on coping with winter in the indoor garden because this can be a, a bit of a stressful time. And this is the time when, when a lot of um, houseplants get, they get overlooked in a sense because we're trying to bring them through spring and summer and then we think, oh yeah, it's, it's winter, it's nice and warm they'll be fine. But this is actually quite a critical time for houseplants, as in a lot of losses can happen. So my main tips would be when it comes to taking care of your indoor plants during the winter months is first thing is heating. So we've got our heating and radiators on. Some of us have underfloor heating. So for those of you who do have underfloor heating and you have, for example, a big plant on the floor, raise it up off the floor because you don't want to cook those roots. And also moving our plants away from heat sources. So move them away from the radiators because that will dry them out. And also moving them away from windows because draft is coming through the windows and that can be detrimental to our house plants. I would also suggest because the air is very dry um, during the winter months, because we've got our heating on, is to mist plants regularly. Um, or you can use pebble trays. So rest your plants on pebble trays to give them the extra humidity that they need or humidifiers as well, which is also great. And also check in for pests. So because our homes are nice and cosy and warm during the winter months, that is kind of a good time for pests to start hatching, breeding in our soil. So check soil regularly 
pull your plants out of the pot and have a look at the roots, make sure there's no infestations happening, check under the leaves and wipe your leaves regularly as well, because that will help um, identify if there's any pests, you can wipe them away. And keeping our leaves dust free also during the winter months because they need to um, absorb as much light as they can. So having them dust free is going to let the leaves catch as much light as they can. And what else can I think of? Oh, yes. Winter dormancy. So a lot of our indoor plants go into a dormancy period during the winter months where they're not growing. The growing season is spring and summer. So they will pretty much stop growing during the winter months or drop their leaves completely. That is completely normal. What you need to do is reduce your watering schedule during the winter months um, because they're not in the active growing season. And also just one point to mention as well, where we are reducing our watering during the winter months because our plants aren't actually in the growing season, we need to stop fertilising our plants because they're not taking up um, nutrients as fast as they would during the summer months when they're actively growing. So definitely stop fertilising plants during the winter months. That is actually one of the number one killers for house plants. is that um, a lot of houseplant owners continue watering throughout the winter months the same way they did in the summer and spring. So they end up overwatering their plants and also overfeeding during the winter. So stop feeding plants during the winter months. Yeah, it's everything's got to slow down, including our plants, I guess. Yeah. You mentioned um, Cissus discolour, and um, and I think I've seen in some of your photos that you've sent me of that particular plant. Is that one of your favourites? Yes, it is. So I love the Cissus discolour. It's also known as the Rex begonia vine, although it's not part of the begonia family. And I have a lovely spread on that in my book on page 87 and also how to propagate it on page 88 and 89. I absolutely love this is this violent plant because it's quite versatile. Um, it's relatively easy, but I love that you can have it trained up a trellis and you can also have it in a hanging basket. And just the leaves are absolutely divine. They are, they have a lovely purpley, deep maroon colour on them, velvety texture. You put them against the light and you can see a shimmery colour running through them. So yeah, that's definitely my favourite plant. I've propagated it so many times. Oh yeah, I bet that's one that people want uh, cuttings of too. Correct, yeah, that is. <laughs> <laughs> any other particular favourites? Um, any other? I do like the string of dolphins, um, which has become really popular um, at the moment. They're a, a form of succulent and the, the actual succulent leaves look like little succulent dolphins which is pretty cute. So yeah, I do love the string of dolphins as well. But to be fair, I love, I just love all plants. <laughs> my, I suppose my least favourite is cactuses. I'm not really a big fan on cactuses because they don't really do much. The, you buy them from the shop and two years later, they look exactly the same. They haven't changed. They, they're very slow growers. In my opinion, they just correct, collect dust in my house. So um, yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, they're my least favourite. <laughs> Well, you, I'm going to have to fight you now, Jade, on that. But um, <laughs> as a very dedicated cactus and succulent mm -hmm. grower. <laughs> but this is the joy of houseplants, that actually there's something for everybody. And the fact that I like something yeah. you don't like is great because that means that there really is something for every every aesthetic, every growing style. Um, that's the beauty of houseplants, that's which right. is what I love. Um, and we don't we don't all have to love the same things, which is is also really true. I often get really sad when people are like, oh, well, I thought I had to grow a fiddle leaf fig because, you know, that's what everyone else was growing, um, you know, in my dark, tiny <laughs> yeah. flat with low ceilings you're like no please don't try and grow a fiddle leaf fig in there you'll be much better off with That's something right. else <laughs> it is it's fascinating and and how has the reaction to the book been have you had um good feedback from people it's an absolutely beautiful book thank you so much yeah i have had really lovely uh, feedback on the book which is which has been really great and um a lot of magazines and newspapers has picked it up and listed it as one of the 
best Christmas gifts or best gardening books. So yeah, it's it's taken its own lease of life, to be honest with you. It's, 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 the feedback has been has been lovely. Well, that is fantastic to speak to you, Jade, and thanks so much for for sharing your knowledge. And I'm I'm delighted to hear that your children are on board with uh, your your house plant collection. <laughs> they and they're, are. they're loving it too. <laughs> That's really good to hear. And um, as a fellow parent, I can honestly say that uh, the time stress is real, but we. <laughs> We have to carve out time for our plants, for our own mental health, don't we? Because it's it's just so important. So I always say that plant care is self-care. Exactly. Amen. Thanks so much, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much to Jade. You can find out more about Jade and her book, The Indoor Garden, in the show notes at janeperone.com. And now it's time to tackle question of the week. And this one comes from Mercy and Mercy wanted to know about wick watering. Now, this is something I've discussed here and there in odd podcasts, but it felt like the right moment to answer a whole question about it. So Mercy wanted to know how wick watering works for me having tried it out and found that it hasn't altogether been successful. So I'm just going to run through how I do wick watering and um, how how that pans out from my point of view and a few things that you might want to look out for. So I'm not going to talk here about self-watering pots that you can buy and set up ready to go because they come with their own set of instructions. What I do is my own methods of wick watering which vary according to the setting and what I have to hand. So wick watering traditionally in the world of Gesneriads often involves having plants sat atop a clear plastic container filled with water with some holes in the top through which a wick is threaded. Then that wick goes up into the bottom of the nursery pot that sat on top and makes contact with the soil in the pot. And as the plant needs more water because the substrate's drying out, water is then sucked up through that wick and supplied to the plant. Now, I don't do a lot of this method, mainly because it isn't the most aesthetically pleasing thing to see a plastic container with a pot on a nursery pot on the top and I don't have room for that massive plant room where really that wouldn't make a difference all my plants are kind of on display so I want them to look as good as they can that said you know I'd love at some point to have my own dedicated plant room with loads of racks full of gizneriads wick watered in exactly that way but right now I tend to try to do a version of wick watering that allows me to use an outer cash pot and an inner nursery pot so that the cash pot hides what's going on with the wick watering so what does that look like it's pretty simple I should say also here that I'm talking about soil based growing if you've listened to the show for any length of time you'll know that I don't really do hydroponic or semi-hydroponic to any great extent. So I'm talking here about soil-based wick watering. So I have my plants still in their plastic nursery pot and that is nestled within a larger cash pot. Now, oftentimes this cash pot will have to be considerably larger than the pot to make this system work. And that's because you're going to have a layer of laker or gravel or some kind of material that will soak up water without deteriorating, some kind of mineral layer at the bottom of the pot. I usually use laker because it's easy to clean and reuse over and over again. So that's expanded clay pebbles, very lightweight too. So that layer will be probably taking up about a third of the height of the pot. So, you know, that's worth bearing in mind. And then the nursery pot will sit on top of that pile of laker. And coming out the bottom of that nursery pot is a wick. Now, people get worried about this. I just use a piece of nylon cord. So this might be something I've recycled from an old gift bag handle. That cord's great. It might be paracord if you're in the scouting or guiding movement that's usually called paracord 
It might be something you get in a haberdashery shop. You can use cotton wick as well. And in fact, I recently got gifted some wick watering pots which come flat packed and then you sort of build them and they do have a wick watering system and they claim to have tested different wicks and found that cotton wicks are better. So just use what you can find, experiment and see which one works best for you. Um, those pots, by the way, if you want to check them out, they are called potrpots.com. Uh, they kindly gifted me a few pots to try. So they come as a flat pack. Uh, made of I think recycled plastic which you can then build and they have a, a reservoir in the bottom and they come with a wick so quite an interesting idea and I'll link to those in the show notes if you want to look at them but anyway on with my own DIY system so you've got your wick uh, nylon wick it needs to be roughly well depends on the size of the pots but let's say on average about 10 centimeters long and depending on how much water the plant likes I will change the number of wicks that I place in each pot. So, for example, if it was a fern or something that likes to stay really quite damp, I would probably have two or three wicks going up into the bottom of that pot. If it was something that likes to be on the drier side, so, for example, a ripsalis of some kind, succulent forest epiphytic cactus, I probably only put one wick up there. So, if you're repotting the plant, that is a great moment to add your wick. And the main thing is that you make sure that a good section of the wick comes into close contact with the compost. So again, you might have to experiment here about how much contact is happening between the substrate and the wick. And that will affect how much water is drawn up. You can have the wick pushed right into the centre of the root ball, or you can have it just curled at the bottom of the pot you're going to have to experiment to see what works best for your plant. So those wicks will be pushed up through the bottom of the pot, particularly if I'm not just repotting. I'll just get a, a kebab stick and I will shove those wicks up, up inside into the substrate, leaving a good length dangling down so that the length of wick dangling is the same, about the same as the depth of the laker at the bottom. Then I will cover the laker with just cover the laker with water and put the pot on the top and make sure the wicks are dangling into that wet laker mix. But the pot is standing on top of the laker, so it's not standing in water. And that's how I get started. The great thing about this particular way of doing things is it doesn't really matter if you're kind of putting the watering can down the side of the pot, the nursery pot and watering into the laker or as I do, just generally watering the top of the pot. Any excess water will run through into the laker and be held there for the plant. And unless you massively overwater, the plant won't be sitting in water in terms of its root ball, but it will have easy access to more moisture. This cuts down the amount of times you need to water and cuts out the pressure in terms of, oh gosh, I've got to remember to go back and check that cash pot doesn't have sitting water in it. When you use wick watering, it's worth looking at the substrate you're using. You may want to use something a bit more free draining than you are used to, because bear in mind, there's going to be just more water around. It's a case of trial and error for a lot of plants. But yeah, generally make that mix a bit more free draining and you will find that you can water quite generously and the plant will just soak it up. The other way you can do wick watering is having multiple pots in one large container with laker at the bottom. I use that a lot for begonias and it works really, really well. As I say, it saves me so much time wick watering. It really does. And then all I need to do um, when I want to check the plant is lift that nursery pot up and have a look at what's going on. The other slight wrinkle is that you will find that some plants produce roots and go into that laker and colonize the laker with roots. Actually, that's a good thing because it means the plant's pulling up water itself. It just does mean when you repot, you have this moment of trying to figure out if you can get the roots um, out of that pot without damaging them. Sometimes you have to cut the pot away to make that possible and pot it up to a new size of pot. But 
I find it's a brilliant system. I would recommend it. And I hope that gives a bit of an explanation about how to do a very, very simple wick watering system. One other tiny caveat, if you are going to have those cash pots on wooden furniture, do stick a little cork mat or coaster underneath the pot because your pot is going to be constantly full of water. Unless it's completely watertight, you might find yourself with damp patches on your wooden furniture. So just be aware of that one. I hope that helps, Mercy. And if you've got a question for On The Ledge, do drop me a line. On the ledge podcast at gmail.com is the address. And now let's hear from this week's listener. It's been a while, hasn't it, since we've heard one of these, but let's hand over to the delightful Dorian to finish the show. My name is Dorian Jones. I'm a motivational speaker and fellow podcaster as well. I'm into personal development space. And um, obviously, I love plants because I'm here. And then I'm also into wine as well. That's just a brief overview about me without going too deep. When did you get into houseplants and why? I said I got into houseplants around the time of the pandemic because I needed something to do. I had already collected a few houseplants and I killed them, but I did like the growth that I had gotten before they died off. So that was something that really helped me dive into it. And I kind of found my niche of the houseplants that I did like. What's the latest addition to your houseplant collection? The latest addition to my houseplant collection is actually a few of them. I have a couple of philodendron. I have a philodendron splendid that I actually just put onto a moss pole. I have a philodendron viricosum as well as a monstera. I can never pronounce this esquilito. I believe I'm saying it right. I actually have a cutting of that that someone at the nursery gave me. So I'm letting that propagate at the moment as we speak. So it's in a vase with the water, letting grow the roots and all that good stuff complete the sentence i love my house plants because i love my house plants because they keep me at peace they help me relax and they also keep me from going out to spend more money so it keeps me busy uh, to say the least who is your house plant hero my house plant hero at the moment is actually uh, who can i say who's someone i've been paying attention to actually I believe it's called the Sydney Houseplant Guy or Sydney Plant Guy on YouTube. I came across him. He talks about the moss poles and he just grows these aeroids and in just a very tropical feel in his household. So that's I say he'd be someone that I call a hero at the moment. And that's just because of the phase that I'm in with all my tropicals. Name your plantagonist, the plant you simply cannot get along with. A plant that I simply can't get along with? I say it's actually two. I have my Monstera Deliciosa. That one I've killed maybe two or three of those. I always overwater them. I over care for them. But I actually have one now that's doing really well. So I haven't killed it yet. We're crossing our fingers on that one. And then I also have an issue with the money trees. I've always killed those. I've killed maybe four of them. But I actually have a large one now that's doing well. One of the brasses is kind of dying off. But overall, it still has a lot of good growth. So those are my two, the Monstera Deliciosa and the Money Tree. I'm crossing my fingers that these last for me. Thank you, Dorian. And if you'd like to be featured on Meet the Listener, do let me know. Put on your brave pants and drop me an email because I know it can be very scary to have to record your own voice and uh, hear yourself. But Honestly, it's a delight. I love receiving these Meet the Listener entries. And if you email on the ledge podcast at gmail.com, my lovely assistant Kelly will talk you through the process. And it's really simple. And we'd love to hear you on the show. So do consider dropping us a line. That is all for this week's show. I'll be back next Friday with more planty pontifications and i do hope you'll join me then bye the music you heard in this episode was roll jordan roll by the joy drops the road we used to travel when we were kids by komiku and overthrown by josh woodward all tracks are licensed under creative commons visit the show notes for details